putting this video out because there's a lot of interest in this welding unit that I made. A lot of people wanted to see a schematic which I did not have at the time. So I'm going to give you more information about this welder, how it's made. Now this is the schematic right here. Now the output is 52 volts. Now the most important part of this whole circuit is the, is the microwave oven transformers that you will be using. The circuit requires two and you want to use two that are very heavy duty. You don't want to use a 600 watt microwave oven. You want to use like a 1000 watt. You want to use one that has a lot of power. Now this is a pretty large transformer here. Now you're going to want two of these transformers. You want to have both of them as close as possible to being the same size. You don't want to have a small transformer wired in series with a larger one. So make sure they're very close in capacity to one another. Now in order to wind this transformer, all right, this lower winding with the two terminals sticking up is your primary. It's a heavier winding and that is where the 120 volts feeds into the transformer. This is where the 2000, this line and these other lines where the 2000 volts leaves heading to the magnetron. Now, it's hard to see because I really can't open it. I don't want to, let me see if I can look in there. All right, you can see there's a lot of very thin wire in there. Because what's happening here, you're going from a lower voltage at a high current into a high voltage into a lower current. So that's why you have a lot of, a lot of turns of a fine wire like this. Now you're going to chop out this entire secondary coil and only leave behind below my thumb. That's all that's going to be there. Now when you chop this out, you want to make sure you don't do any damage. You don't want to nick this copper coil in the bottom or anything. So you're going to want to slide in between these two coils right here a piece of sheet metal and put some masking tape on the bottom of the sheet metal that faces the enamel wire on the primary so you don't scuff it up. So you're going to tape the bottom of a maybe like a drywall putty knife, like a three or a three or four inch putty knife. And then you're going to push it in there tight. And then you're going to lay this on the ground. And you're going to take a very sharp chisel. And you're going to put it right against the core. And you're going to hammer and continue to chop there and there on both sides. And you're going to go slow until the whole end cap pops off. And then you can carefully tap out the rest of the core in this direction and it will slide out. Now once that's removed and it's just a nice hollow cavity in there above the primary, then you're going to take some 10 gauge stranded wire. Don't use solid. It'll be almost impossible to get it through this coil. You're going to take a look at the bottom one. All right. You want to see how this coil is wound. You want to know if it's wound in this direction clockwise or if it's wound counterclockwise because whichever way this coil is wound is exactly the direction you want to wind your 10 gauge wire. Now in this case I could tell by the terminal which is hard for you to see that this wire here goes in that direction down and around so it's wound clockwise so when you wind this one with the 10 gauge wire in the exact same direction that the primary coil is wound below it. So if this, if the primary is going uh, counterclockwise, you don't want to wind this one going clockwise. So once you establish the direction that your primary coil is going, you're going to wind the 10 gauge stranded copper through this cavity and out the other side, out this cavity and into that cavity and fill up the entire core very important when you start to wind this core that you make sure it's very snug and neatly wound because if it's all sloppy you're not going to get more than 12 or 13 turns in there so lay it out nice and clean as you're winding it you may want to rub a little bit of silicone grease on the outside of the wire which will help to get the wire to go through the core easily so you can slide it through but just put as much as you could fit which is roughly 18 to 20 turns leave six inches sticking out here and six inches sticking out here and you're going to repeat the process 
for the other transformer that you will be using because you do require two. Get both of those and you put those aside. Now this is the schematic. You're going to have 120 volts fed into the unit using a 14 gauge 3 prong uh, plug grounded wire. You're going to have your line, there's your neutral and there's your ground. The ground will connect to the metal chassis like you see right there, grounded onto the chassis. You're going to have a 15 amp switch right there. Once the power goes on, when that switch closes, you will have your neon lamp come on, which is connected to the neutral here. So current will flow. You'll have the neon lamp come on. Uh, the neon lamps normally come with a 47K built-in drop resistor. Now, if you don't have a neon lamp with a 47K, if you do not have a neon lamp laying around with a 47K drop resistor, you could always use an LED. And it's very simple. You could just power it through a resistor. You could use like a 15K ohm coming off of the line coming in. And then it could flow into a red LED connecting to the neutral line. So once the switch goes on, instead of the neon lamp coming on, you would have a red LED coming on. And that will run just fine like that because it's running at an extremely low current. And the inrush or anything else shouldn't harm that LED. Now, on the line, after it turns, after the switch closes and the neon lamp comes on, it's going to connect to your primary coil. So you want to make sure you connect the line to the same terminal on both tra uh, transformers. So I put both of mine on this side and then I put both of the neutrals on this side. As you can see here, the line comes in, flows into one terminal through the primary winding and it goes straight to the neutral. And then the 120 volt line continues on, flows into the other transformers primary and then that goes to neutral. So now both of these are being powered at the same time. Now once the primaries are connected, you're going to connect the secondaries. So remember I told you each one has to be wound in the exact same direction. So whichever wire goes in on this side has to match the secondary on this one. So if, so if this one goes in here and then winds that way, then this one has to go in and wind the same direction. So say these are wound clockwise. You have a wire going in, right? And then it winds around. When it's all done with its turns, it comes out on the right. This has to be wound the same way. So if, it's, if this one's wound clockwise, that one's wound clockwise, the right wire on this one will feed into the start of this one, which is the left. The two on the outside ends will create the higher voltage AC. So the output combined will be between 32 and 38 volts heading into the rectifier. Now I used a 110 amp automotive one, which looks like this. All right, inside the automotive diode, what you have is you'll have six. There's six diodes connected like this. Now in your alternator, it's three phase. You're getting three phases of AC going into each set of diodes. So you have one phase going in, all right? goes between the two diodes, and that converts it to DC current. The other phase comes in from your stator coil, and it goes into these set of diodes, and that converts that to DC. And then the last phase comes in to the last set of diodes and converts that to DC. So you get each, each phase of the stator coil combines all the current up to come out once. So each phase from the stator coil sends in a certain amount of current, one-third of the total capacity of the alternator. So if it's a 105 amp alternator, you have to figure each one of these phases coming in is roughly 35 amps. So that's how you get the full 105 coming out on the plus and the minus, because you have these three sets of diodes. Now for this project, we only require two sets but I didn't want to see this last set go to waste, so all I did was parallel it up with one side, which wouldn't hurt. It just, if anything, it would just help to prevent this set of diodes from burning out because you have the extra diodes in parallel with it. All right, so this is how you're going to set it up. 
as you can see, these are the three sets of diodes. All right. Now I'm showing the three phases coming from your stator, from the alternator. What we're going to do is this one leg that went... Now keep in mind, we only need two of these sets. We're going to take this leg and we're going to tie it in to this diode. So you can have the line going from there to there to there. Just like you see here now. Scribble that out. These two sets of diodes are now connected in parallel. Now for added safety to protect the diodes, there's a 0.22 microfarad 250 volt nonpolar capacitor on each side. So from where the AC goes into the diode, you're going to put one capacitor to the minus and one capacitor to the plus. And you're going to do the exact same thing to help protect this set. Go from the plus rail to the center where the AC goes in. And then from that point, you put another capacitor to the negative rail. All right, so it's also important to know that here are the diodes, all right? This is a piece of Bakelite. This whole piece has to be isolated from the housing. So when you connect it, make sure it's on something that separates it from the housing. And then you want to have the cooling fan near this. So you want to position your cooling fan so it cools off the rectifier and also circulates some air through the rest of the housing for the transformers. Here you can see where I joined the two sets of diodes together with the plate. That's one set of diodes and that's another. So that's one leg and this is the other leg. Once leaving the capacitor, once leaving the rectifier, it's going to go into a capacitor which is used for smoothing out the DC. And in this case, I use the 80 volt, 18,500 microfarad. Once leaving the capacitor, it goes into a MOV, which is a metal oxide varistor, and that's there to help protect the diodes again. The diodes have a certain maximum rated voltage, so you want to keep this rating, the maximum DC rating of the MOV, you'd like to have it less than the maximum of the diodes. So the purpose of the MOV is to protect the diodes. From this point you have the negative connecting to the electrode holder and the positive in my case goes to the clamp. The cooling fan is another 12 volt transformer. You take the line coming in which is when you turn the switch on it feeds 120 to this line. That goes into the primary of the 12 volt transformer. The other side of the primary goes to the neutral line of the 120 AC. Then you have the secondary of the 12 volt transformer. That goes into a 1 amp bridge rectifier, which you can make from 1N4003 to 4007 diodes. That goes into a 16 volt 470 microfarad capacitor for smoothing and into your cooling fan. Okay, now this is the size electrodes you want to use. These are 1 16th inch diameter. I got them at Harbor Freight Tools. And you want to make sure you use this size and nothing larger because this keeps the current down. If you go thicker, more current on the transformers and they will heat up. So you want to make sure you use 1 16th inch. Like most other welders, this unit also has a duty cycle. You do not want to continuously weld. You could take a stick, you could do some welding, then you allow the unit to cool for a little while, and then you could do it again. You just don't go non-stop. This is not designed for non-stop welding.